Hello? Welcome, everybody. Okay. Okay, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the ArcticWise talk for this evening. My name is Ezra Green. I'm a MA student in anthropology and a member of the Polar Club, who's one of the partners in organizing this ArcticWise talk series. Uh, to begin, I want to just acknowledge that we are on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And uh, we're always very lucky to be able to do talks like this on the, uh, on the territory. So uh, we thank them. Just a little bit of uh, information about upcoming talks as we move forward before we get into tonight's talk. Uh, there is a talk in just a couple weeks on Tuesday, March 10th, called The Subsea Permafrost and the Methane Cycle on the Siberian Continental Shelf, Predictive Modeling for Climate Change, which will be by David Archer, who is a geophysical scientist from the University of Chicago. And in April, there's going to be a workshop event and an associated talk. <laughs> okay. And an associated talk uh, with apologies. <laughs> there will be a uh, Arctic Studies workshop and associated Arctic Wise lecture. The date will be determined shortly, and the speakers will be determined shortly. So, look forward to that. Okay, so in this evening's talk, Mobilizing Arctic Knowledge, Perspectives from the United Nations Conference on Climate Change and Arctic Film Broadcast, we will explore one of the major issues currently affecting the world and a subject of deep academic, political, and social interest, climate change. Two of our presenters, Christopher Carter and Catherine Turigny, are from the Youth Arctic Coalition, an independent global forum for youth to voice their opinions, make collaborative decisions and declarations, and work to influence the course of Arctic governance. One particular area of concern for the Youth Arctic Coalition is how climate change will affect Arctic communities and climate change policy. Our two, pre two presenters recently went to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was the 20th conference of the parties, and it's also known as COP20. This took place in December in Lima, Peru. They will be sharing their experiences from COP20 and relating how discussions and decisions at this type of international conference relate to Arctic communities and peoples. Additionally, we will discuss the role that film has in communicating Arctic policy issues. We will do this by screening segments of the innovative 10-part film series, The Polar Sea. We will also connect online with Jody Shapiro, a Canadian filmmaker who oversaw the story development of the Polar Sea. He will be discussing the film and the filmmaker's approach to creating it. So now I'd like to introduce you further to our presenters and then hand over the floor to them for the, the presentation. Christopher Carter is a graduate student in UBC School of Community and Regional Planning. He holds a bachelor's degree with honors in anthropology and visual communication from Montana State University. He has worked as a strategic planning analyst, filmmaker, and researcher in several contexts, including work in Greenland, Mongolia, the Philippines, Morocco, the United States, and Canada. He was a delegate to COP20 through his involvement with the Youth Arctic Coalition. Catherine Trigny is an undergraduate student in behavioral neuroscience at UBC. She has worked with an oceanography research group from the Oregon Health and State Science University, taking baseline measurements in Antarctica and looking into how oceanographic changes affect human health. She is currently doing ongoing research with BC's, Children, BC's Children's Hospital, studying the influence of social and, and environmental factors on chronic health issues in, with children in, the BC, in British Columbia and the Yukon. She was also a delegate to COP20 through her involvement with the Youth Arctic Coalition. Finally, Jody Shapiro, who you'll see later, he's Skyping in with us, is a Canadian film producer and director 
who, has recently, who recently oversaw the story development for the newly released series, The Polar Sea. His other works, including Icebreaker, An Idea of Canada, How to Start Your Own Country, Bert's Buzz, and Green Porno, have been featured in festivals from Sundance to the Toronto International Film Festival. The Polar Sea is his third film made in the Arctic. So without further ado, I'd like to present Christopher and Catherine. Okay, so hello everyone. Um, thanks Ezra for the introduction. My name is Catherine Trini and I'm a science student here at University of British Columbia. Um, let's get the slides going, CJ. Okay, cool. Perfect. So um, my talk's gonna be a little bit more general. Um, I'm gonna speak to the youth involvement at the UN level, um, also how that relates to the idea of intergenerational equity and also um, some ideas for circumpolar collaboration. So first I have this image, um, it's quite complicated, but this basically is the structure of the UNFCCC, which stands for United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, at the top you have the Conference of the Parties, COP is the supreme decision-making body, um, and they analyze the emission submissions from parties and also assess measures by the parties to reach emission reductions targets. And I've got some red arrows on the screen as well. So the red arrows are really just highlighting groups that are major talking points this year in Lima. Um, first, we have SUBSTA, which is a subsidiary body for scientific and technological, technological advice. Um, they are really the link between the IPCC and the policy work of the COP. Uh, they link the science and policy together, and they work really closely with SBI, which is a uh, subsidiary body for implementation on things such as capacity building, vulnerability, um, and key political issues. Uh, we have the ADP, which is the ad hoc working group on the Durban platform for advanced action. And they're responsible for creating the protocol or legal document that's going to be uh, signed in uh, Paris next year. So that was a big push in Lima to get some negotiation and text, draft text going so that all parties can agree to it in Paris. And last with the Green Climate Fund. I piloted the Green Climate Fund just because this year they reached the US $10 billion um, target for um, climate funding. And this will allow them to now mobilize funds to help support developing countries. And there really were some interesting discussions that popped up about how to access these funds. So these are some of the big working groups. But what you'll find is that researchers and non-governmental organizations are more active at the constituency level. Um, and a lot of this is done inside events um, and different events that happen around the city at the same time while COP's going on. And this is where we really saw the most promise for collaboration especially on the Arctic front. So which NGOs are represented? Um, we really, really like acronyms when it comes to um, the UN and COP. So just from left to right, we have BINGO, which is business and industry NGO, um, the local government municipal authorities, environmental NGO, the farmer representation, uh, trade union NGO, women and gender groups, um, indigenous people's organizations, YUNGO, which is the youth NGO, and RINGO, which is research and independent uh, non-governmental organizations. And I just started those because they were kind of the most pertinent to this talk. So uh, the IPO this year really focused on the rights of Indigenous peoples. They also wanted to have these rights included more in negotiations text and the decision-making process. And they also wanted more focus on traditional knowledge and transfer education. Um, Yungo, which is a youth non-governmental organization, uh, really called for the need for sustainable development that will last into the future. Uh, we were working towards equal representation of northern and southern youth at the COP level and emphasized this through intergenerational equity and how this lies really at the bottom of the negotiations process. And RINGO, which is really important for us, especially being students and working at UBC, uh, represents all the researchers, students, academics, lawyers, and people who work in these programs all around the world. And they really emphasize uh, getting science into policy. One of the challenges that we stated this year was that uh, transforming science into wise policy and getting that policy into action. The challenge of that is really underestimated. It's hard to do when you have so many parties working all together within just two weeks at these major conferences. But they do represent a lot of different fields. They work with a lot of stakeholders and uh, they have some pretty innovative um, climate change conclusions at all levels and are really, really good networking groups. So the youth experience at the UN level, um, I had accreditation for the second week and Christopher was there for the first, um, but I think we can both agree that it was very, very overwhelming to show up. 
um, and be thrown into this huge negotiating process. It was quite a learning curve. There are upwards of 100 different booths and groups you can be speaking to on any given day, and they change. Um, there were 10 to 15 side event talks that were happening all at the same time, and of course you have events going around the city, you have rallies, actions, and the plenary sessions which are happening, which is where all the countries are negotiating. So we really tried to get to um, as many events as possible to advocate on behalf of the Youth Arctic Coalition. Um, and I think looking back, it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly what the youth experience is at these conferences, just because youth are involved in most levels of the UN process. And um, everyone's perspectives and challenges and opinions are obviously going to be different. So when asked to share what the youth experience was like, I just want to begin with the fact that youth are quite involved in all these levels. Not every single one of them, and it definitely needs some improvement, um, but youth are actively participating. And that can look like uh, just running booths. Um, a couple of really successful side events were run this year by youth groups. Um, youth groups were successful in getting um, their wishes put into you know, negotiations text. And also meetings with government officials. It's generally a really positive and respectful environment. And uh, these positions that youth have are not just ceremonial. Um, youth are definitely taken seriously. And I think there is room for improvement, but it's, we're definitely going in the right direction. So I've listed some of the important youth groups that we had the chance to work with when we were there. Um, Yango, I've already introduced, the Youth Non-Governmental Organization. Um, Yango organizes the Conference of the Youth, which happens before COP, and it's really a space for um, youth to develop their um, climate agenda before the conference begins. And Yango also organizes Young and Future Generations Day at COP, where intergenerational equity is highlighted as one of the challenges facing the negotiation process. Uh, youth are also uh, represented lots of different NGO, uh, different NGOs. A couple I want to talk about. Earth in Brackets is a multidisciplinary um, university, and they have a lot of international students. They were there. Global Voices is an Australian group which works to get youth involved in international environmental policy making. Um, and the International Federation for uh, Medical Students Association this year was successful in getting health co-benefit language implemented in the negotiations text. So that was a really, really big step um, for youth at this UN level. And you also have different university groups from all over the world and youth involved in official country delegations. Um, uh, for example, you have the Canadian youth delegation. We met with the Taiwanese youth delegation. And some governments do have official youth representatives that are not observer status. They are actual party status. And they can go in and work with the governments. So where does this leave us in terms of intergenerational equity? We have lots of youth at the conference. And we like to be able to think of youth as the agents of change. Um, intergenerational equity is the idea that or should be passed to future generations in as good condition as it was inherited. And current and future generations should be given equal value in the negotiations process. And climate change really now is a serious moral problem um, because those who have contributed to least the climate change are going to be impacted the most. And this is just, doesn't just include youth anymore. Um, we're also talking about people who live in developing countries and also indigenous populations around the world. So there really need to be equitable relationships between these generations and the inclusion of youth in the formal negotiations process, not just at the NGO level. And one way you can do that is just with the idea of distributive justice, um, just needing more voices, especially from those living um, in some of these most affected regions. And it is working very, very slowly. Intergenerational equity is being implemented into law and policy. Uh, we're in a very crucial period because the next signing will be happening this winter in Paris. The deadline is quickly approaching. And we really would have liked to have this language included in the text. So leading up to COP21, um, some of the things that I think would be most important in order to get intergenerational equity included, uh, you need to have party support, first of all. The people who are on the ground negotiating, you need to have them backing your cause. Um, intergen intergenerational equity has already been supported by the Independent Alliance for Latin America and the Caribbean. Um, recently in Geneva at the ADP meeting, they requested a standalone segment identifying human rights gender responsive approaches, gender equality, and intergenerational equity. So that was a major stepping stone. And intergenerational equity also has a lot um, of support from the Dominican Republic and the African group, African group including all the climate negotiators um, from the African continent. Um, we need mechanisms for youth representation, the UNFCCC process. I've mentioned how we've been very involved in the NGO level, but it would be nice to have more representation at the government delegation level. And uh, some of the ideas that have been put forth, one UK group in particular identified possibly having an intergenerational equity arbiter or ombudsman, which acts as an advocate 
oversees disputes or acts as a liaison. Um, and the Youngo actually established an intergenerational equity working group um, in 2013 to promote the inclusion of intergener intergenerational equity in the text um, that was part of the Warsaw outcomes. And last, we just need legal acknowledgement, which will come at COP21, hopefully. Um, it has been acknowledged in the UNFCCC and also in the Rio Declaration, but not yet by the ADP, and the ADP is responsible for drafting that legally binding text. So that's where you need to have intergenerational equity included. So the last thing we're going to talk about briefly is circumpolar collaboration. Um, I think we were definitely a little disappointed at the lack of budget representation at COP. It might have just had something to do with um, the South American location, but there were definitely other groups that we talked to um, that were disappointed and said how it wasn't as prominent as in past years. So the good news is that there are very, uh, there are many very motivated people and groups who want to include Arctic um, issues into negotiation process and want to bring it into the forefront at COP21. Um, so I can speak to what the YAC did at COP and what we're planning on doing leading up to COP21, which would kind of be um, an indicator of what other people are doing. But, sorry. Okay. Um, one thing that we did is we want to highlight collaboration with Arctic states and other stakeholders. Um, throughout COP, YAC worked closely with uh, the governments of Yukon, North East Territories, and Nunavut. Um, also, the Yukon brought a youth representative who we've maintained close contact with. Um, also, Norden and NOAC. Uh, NOAC is the Nordic Working Group for Global Climate Negotiations, and they were very um, excited and welcoming to speak to us, and we kept in contact with them. They're interested in hosting a side event at COP21, which YAC will hopefully be able to contribute to. Um, I personally met with a government official from the government of Greenland who was not only very, very supportive and welcoming and positive about having youth involved, but he actively said, yes, let's plan a side event at COP21. Um, for NGO and for youth especially, I think it's important to have side events. That's where you can reach the most amount of people. Um, basically what I mean by a side event is just talks that happen throughout the COP. They go from morning until night, and these are happening at the same time as all the plenary conversations. Um, the general idea of the UN picture where you have all the groups sitting, those are just the plenary side events are kind of like talks we have right now. And that's where you can get really interested groups to come and listen to your cause. So we would hopefully be able to plan a couple of these talks. Um, we'd also like to get more uh, working with research and educational institutions. Um, there's a prof we met particularly from the University of the Faroe Islands who's developing a West Nordic Studies master's program, um, which will get master's students outside the classroom up into the Arctic, and that will be spanned across all the Nordic countries, Faroe Islands, Iceland, and Greenland. And um, looking forward, the YAC has also been in connection with the French Polar Cluster, obviously government in Greenland and NOAC. And with proper promotion, I think this is definitely the best way to reach most people at the COP is by running these side events. And the last that we think that we importantly need is traditional and scientific knowledge translation and policy. Um, this is where I'm going to pass it off over to Christopher. But I think that is um, that's really the last key to get our Arctic issues up on the forefront. Uh, we need to have the research backing it. We need to have the people in place. We need to have um, governments who are willing to work with us in order to host these side events and bring these issues um, up into plenary sessions. Thank you. Jody, can you hear us? Jody, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Excellent. So I'm going to do my yep. section. We're going to roll uh, into the films and to you. So here we go. Okay, great. So we'll come back to this. This is so we, we do work on the ground as well, and this is an example of that. So. Um, I'd just like to speak to a little bit about my experience personally, uh, my kind of relationship to the Arctic over the years and how that has informed um, my interest in being part of, of Arctic policy at different scales, both in communities and at the UN level. Uh, certainly uh, there is a tremendous, it's a tremendously complex um, process and I hope to illustrate some of the ways in which scientific and traditional knowledge can be, can be entertained at the both at, both at the same time to better, to better inform climate action policy. So, uh, of course, this is a very personal experience, uh, and a lot of my interest in the Arctic comes from a trip I took with my parents uh, in 1994. My mom's actually here in the audience, and that was an, it was a, an Alaskan health, and it was uh, health and education, and it was at the University of, of Anchorage, and 
as a five-year-old, that was a very impressionable experience. Later on in 2011, I had the chance to work with medical anthropologists in Greenland on a sexual health project. Uh, in 2013, with polar biologists on a series of films in Hudson Bay. And hopefully, fingers crossed, next year with an Arctic Fulbright. Um, and so this is this is a very tremendous, uh, and I wanted to thank all the people who made that possible. Everybody from the International Institute for Sustainable Development, who secured the pass, um, to friends and, and organizations like YAC, um, who made who made all those other small things happen. So showing up at this tremendously uh, large event, you're in a military installation for about you know anywhere between 10 and 12 hours a day and it's, you have about a thousand things going on at the same time. Everyone's speaking in acronyms. You have hundreds of languages literally going around you. And to try to, to, try to navigate that is really complex, especially when you tend to be curious about everything. So there's a lot of exhaustion, but by the third day, you start to really start to filter through what you, what you uh, ought to be going to, what's available. At the core of this is something called the Advancing the Durban Platform. And this one was actually released last week. This advanced version uh, from Geneva, and this was an approved negotiating text. And entering COP20, the uh, text was about 14 pages. And as the negotiations went on, as people tried to, to, to work in uh, different clauses and, and things in the preamble, important things like human rights and indigenous rights, which I didn't know were separate until going there, this, this text has ballooned to over 40 pages. And as we move into March uh, and, and as we move into Paris, this is a tremendously complex process, but the focus is on the language in this, as it will be a legally binding document um, if it is to be signed in Paris. So a lot of this is, is based on understanding this text to the right. And every day there's revisions. I have copies of it here. Later you can check it out. Um, but but that, is, that is really kind of the document that we're working with here. So when we, when we go to COP20, it's, it's complex, but a few important things happened this year. We had... China show up, we had the United States show up, they had done some negotiations beforehand, uh, and we had a lot of, we had all the important players at the table. And, and granted, we had a lot of focus, we had a lot of action coming from the executive levels of countries, but certainly, where, where was the Arctic? And what I hope to, to talk about today is where can scientific knowledge that's coming from the scientific community um, and, and even from this campus uh, can be introduced into climate action policy, but also where does our kind of traditional understandings of how the, the land is changing and how these social and, and environmental relationships are changing, where can those come into this process and where can it come into regional planning? So just to understand it, another large diagram, don't get too afraid, but we do have some, some, some major kind of themes here. And, and certainly this year we saw a large shift away from this, this mitigation of reducing global greenhouse gas emissions into actually adaptation addressing things like vulnerability uh, and hazard as it relates to that. So that's really where we start to see this kind of knowledge being mobilized. We can use scientific assessment. We can use traditional knowledge of, of um, maximum flooding. Th these are things where this, this is really exciting work that's happening. Of course, we need to pay for it. This is really important coming this March. We have this thing called independently determined national contributions. Large emitters will ultimately pay for what they have contributed based on climate modeling. And that, that will go into to an adaptation fund um, that's already reached over $10 billion. Um, and we've, we've saw some amazing participation of 27 countries already, um, five of which are developing countries like Mongolia, South Korea, uh, and Brazil. So these things are coming together. This is the framework that we're working with. So some broad observations coming from um, my, my work sitting into some of these working groups, looking at the texts. We have a lot going on all at once, but from the kind of the traditional knowledge, uh, we, of course, uh, the UN is the go-to document when you're in indigenous communities, especially, you know, two weeks ago I had a chance to sit in at the UN, uh, Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and they're referencing the UN DRIP, the Declarations of in Indigenous Peoples, not the national language. So I think at this very simple level, the understanding that comes uh, from these kind of declarations of indigenous rights are a major pathway at all levels for Arctic um, rights. Uh, the UN Indigenous Peoples Congress, uh, of course, uh, as well as the Many Strong Voices was part of the first Arctic impact, uh, climate impact assessment. And that included traditional knowledge and it was part of the Nairobi work program on vulnerability. 
Uh, of course, scientific, we have the IPCC reports that come out. We have four flavors of the report, everything from like geophysical to, to, to vulnerability and policy instruments. And then really we're looking at the most interesting work that we can do from a policy and a planning standpoint is where these come together and where, where can we take you know, things that, that draw off of place-based knowledge with some scientific assessment and to make really important, that, in, in important decisions based on values. So that's what I'd like to talk about here. So at COP20 Lima, it was the first time that the indigenous peoples had their own convention and they had their own, um, basically like a pavilion. And within that, as we were in the Amazonian people's territories uh, and, and also the mountainous uh, tribes here, we had representation of all these stories of climate change, which was very powerful. It was very visual. Uh, it was very, um, very much in the qualitative sense powerful. Um, and it also created this platform for people to speak to some of the hot issues. Right now we have two really, uh, two really interesting topics that, that took over the kind of the legal and the, and the policy um, uh, working groups. And one was, is indigenous, or indigenous rights different than human rights? And, and the UN has declared both of those in separate documents. And when we're working within a climate change legal, legally binding document, do we need to make different pr provisions based on who people identify as? So this is powerful, especially as we start to think about doing adaptation programs and mitigation programs like REDD. This is, this is aimed at retaining the amount of forest that we have, reducing the amount of desertification. But that, that's all based on land management. And if you have policy actions that are affecting indigenous land management, this is where you're starting to see conflict. So people are excited about these programs, but they do have real implications for land use planning, indigenous planning around the world. So some policy demands. These came out of the working groups. Um, again, human, human rights-based approach, but specifically on the UN DRIP, the Indigenous Peoples uh, Human Rights Declaration. Um, just being able to recognize and use TEK, recognize it as a legitimate form of knowledge in doing evidence-based policy. Uh, Community-based monitoring systems, FPIC, this is something that the Inter, uh, International Labor Organization has really um, solidified. This is important when we do these big you know, these green energy projects, these all have implications. And consent, not consultation, is what indigenous groups are going for. So these are coming up. And of course, um, direct access to finance. A lot of times, like we're seeing in the Arctic, um, we have federal governments represented. But we don't necessarily have independent indigenous governments that have the same access to finance. So these are the things that are being worked through. We are, I think all of us have heard of the IPCC reports, and um, I think we like to believe that at the UN level, we're making value-free, we're having value-free science inform international policy. And I think anybody who's looked into kind of the subjective nature of, of investigation and how we navigate things like false positives can understand that science has values as well. And at the UN level, um, there has been a, a movement in the last month this is the chairman of the IPCC that says it's, it's beyond that point where we, we as scientists inform policy. Uh, when policymakers should present something to us and if it fits within climate models, we should give it the green light. And I think this is, this is kind of one of the times where that kind of scientific, uh, that kind of scientific assertion has been made. And, and this is, I don't, it's a pretty large statement, but I think it's an important one to make because right now, uh, science is very much a, a large part of the, the SBSTA, which is the scientific and technological body that informs the UN. We don't have the equivalent with, with indigenous knowledge, but certainly um, there's an opportunity to combine them. So how do we do that? Um, moving out of, out of COP20, we have a lot of momentum. We have 100 countries who are on the same page with the negotiating text. Um, in March, they'll come to the table with their uh, their independent contributions, these are payments and actions that will reduce their overall emissions. Uh, and just like the chairman of the IPC said in the, in the slide previous, scientists should have the final say on this uh, as far as, as, as what's acceptable. We, uh, again, we, we do have a lot of money in the Green Adaptation Fund. This will come into things like uh, countries who will no longer exist in 20 years and who are buying land in other places in, in the world, coastal communities, uh, other people who are ex experiencing desertification, 
things like that. The Red Plus program I mentioned, and one of the one of the most fascinating things, cities are acting on this. Not only are they 70% of the of the global emissions, they're doing most of the action. So we had a fascinating meeting with the mayors um, at the city hall in Lima, and they released the global protocol for greenhouse gas emissions. So that means that everyone's using the same method to to catalog how much uh, a city would be um, emitting. So these are these are great these are great things that we can move forward and. I think people moved out of Copenhagen with a lot of doubt, and I think moving into Paris, this is um, this might be one of the last real opportunities to move something through, from my uh, observation. So we have a, a series of, of a series of um, kind of uh, stones, stepping stones, uh, and there are opportunities for science and, and also indigenous working groups to make their voices known. Um, this there will be a meeting in June. Uh, in Bonn, and this will be, people have opportunities to do basically 10-minute briefings based on uh, their reporting and, and their working groups to the, uh, to the working, to the COP20 the COP parties, and that's, that's certainly exciting. So, as I mentioned, we, we kind of, we think about the UNFCC process uh, and also a lot of um, climate policy or even public policy as, a, as kind of a value-free um, uh, process that's based on evidence, and I think I think um, in a certain degree it's powerful. You have a lot of scientific advancement, but there is a power of making our values very very clear. And also when we're dealing with something like a risk assessment, how do we make our values about what's important known in, in this policy process? So this is a fantastic book that was just published in November, and it really looks at the intersection of scientific research human values and policy, especially in the field of climate and risk, uh, risk assessment. And uh, there's this idea that if we, if we do need to make our values known, and that if, if we do take these assessments, and based on our, on our values, uh, if we're an indigenous person, if we're a, a mother, if we're, or, you know, you fill in the blank, we all have different ways that we perceive risk and things around, around uh, climate hazard and change. And, and um, very much need to engage in this kind of deliberative practice. I'm glad Paulo joined later to deal with things like participatory decision making. Um, and she recommends this thing called a consensus conference. And this is a, you really can't do it more than, with more than 50 people. But the idea is that it's a way to inform policy based on the people who are most impacted by that. And one opportunity that I see coming out of the field of decision analysis and planning is this idea of multi-criteria assessment for policy. Um, what you have up here is your criteria um, on your, on your y-axis. And then on the top, you have your different options. And based on how they perform, they're colored. But given the degree in which they, um, you can weight certain factors. So you can say that, you know, it's very important that we have transport infrastructure. And from that, we can get a better uh, sense of what is a good decision based on values beyond just money. We can weight the environmental outcomes. We can, we can weight the social impacts. So these are really powerful things. And I think you know, this idea of evidence-based policy is coming from the field of medicine, if anyone has heard of knowledge translation. And uh, we understand there's a delay in that process. But in the face of climate uh, adaptation and, and certainly climate impacts where we need to pay attention to something called the precautionary principle. This idea that we, as, as people making decisions, should heed to um, any uh, mortal risk and, and if we have an opportunity to mitigate that, we, we need to act on that. So this, these are kind of institutional ways of approaching this. And um, we have a lot of knowledge. It's, I think the idea is we don't necessarily need more science. We need to mobilize what we know. We have a, a, tr a tremendous amount of, of traditional and scientific understanding, and now is the time to mobilize that. So we, these are all reports that came out this year. SLICA is basically the circumpolar census of Inuit peoples. We, we know what's happening, and I think the big piece that's missing is how to mobilize that knowledge. So looking forward, we have a lot of really powerful relationships. We've just partnered with the IISD's Arctic Initiative. We have some support from Polar Bears International and some excitement from Norden Nordic Ministries to do a side event in Paris. We also attend regional decision making and uh, in conferences, economic conferences. So uh, we work at different scales and we can mobilize this knowledge in those processes.
much as, as Catherine outlined, we have friends working in, in different capacities. There's a lot of good collaboration that was present. And thank you so much. We'd like to bring Jody into the conversation. We're going we're gonna to screen uh, two clips, and then we will let you know. You, you should hear it as soon as it's done, Jody. OK. <laughs> So we're starting off with the, the, uh, the Inuit story of the woman coming off the land. Bond Inlet is a small Inuit community of about 1,300 people. The Inuit call it Mitimaktalik. ตัวนี้อาทิตย์นุนกิจออกตัวอาคาร์กุนทำงานนุนกิจตัวติดกูอุปนัยก็คือมักชิมาบกกราสุอุปนัยก็คือรูปตัวติดกูอีกกี่
any greenhouse gas, radiation reflected off the Earth's surface, you pass that infrared radiation through it, it's going to warm over time. It's a greenhouse gas, and so the more greenhouse gases you have in the atmosphere, the more warming you would see. And so that's the general concept there and the importance of greenhouse gases. Matt Martinson works in a lonely outpost that's just up the coast from Prudhoe Bay. His job is to monitor the atmosphere. You find in general that it's one of those forms of science that if you're talking about the atmosphere of another, uh, another planet or something, you might have people not even debate that it's uh, interesting to measure it, but it seems kind of a little politically charged. Matt runs America's northernmost atmospheric data station. Every day, he measures hundreds of unseen changes in the air. I really like this job because I never feel like I'm doing the same thing day in, day out. And so for me, that's really rewarding. Our group of NOAA chose this spot because it's the northernmost point in the United States. Since we're measuring air, we'd like to get some Arctic air. There's nothing between us and the Beaufort Sea and the Arctic Oceans. So we've got a tower with a bunch of airlines on it, uh, measuring air from outside, going into our different instruments inside. Just to have a standard uh, unit of measurement that other people can base science off of is really important. And so those are the types of measurements we have here, our baseline measurements for things like greenhouse gases and CO2. So it's got uh, two flasks in it that we send back to Boulder, which is where our headquarters lab is. And they measure uh, the flasks for uh, uh, greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane and also a lot of uh, important things for tracing the greenhouse gases. Most of the major greenhouse gases are going up pretty consistently. Barrow has the biggest seasonal fluctuation up and down. That's because we're influenced by all the uh, boreal forests like uh, in Canada and Siberia. But in general, it's all going up over time. The frightening conclusion from Matt's work is not just the buildup of greenhouse gases. It's in the evidence of feedback loops. People usually talk about CO2 and they talk about greenhouse gases, and then the next thing in the conversation is usually methane. And methane in the Arctic in particular is important because there's giant carbon stores in the tundra, and so the warmer things get in the Arctic, the more of that methane you're going to give off out of the tundra. More methane and greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which causes more warming, and then you get back to flying out more out of the tundra, and that's, that's what we call a positive feedback loop, and there's a couple of those in the Arctic, and methane's one of the important ones. So I'd like to introduce Jody, who's joining us, or sorry, Jody, who's joining us from afar. And he was involved in the story development, research, and producing of this Polar Sea series. It was supported by a German uh, television company, and it's a 10-part series, including a 360-degree documentary that we saw a sample of, and is really just spectacular work. If, if you if you'll never go to the Arctic, this is about the closest <laughs> that you can that you can come. And so, Jody, welcome, and uh, I can, as soon as we hit the, uh, the discussion, I'll, uh, we have 30 friends here. Uh, okay, great. Us. 
Um, so I'll let you take it away here. I have, I have some, some visuals from the story development process uh, of the 10 different stories. Uh, and yeah, I just thought I'd open it up for, for you. Great, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm maybe not too far away. I'm in Toronto. I don't want to... <laughs> maybe um, uh, maybe it'd be great if I said I was in Resolute Bay or something, but uh, sadly, just Toronto. It's, it's about as cold as Resolute Bay here, but uh, anyway. Um, uh, yeah, well, uh, you know, I should point out this 10-part uh, this series called The Polar Sea is now actually, uh, I believe, being broadcast on the Knowledge Network in B.C., um, I think it started a couple of weeks ago, and um, but all the episodes, or at least the first couple of episodes, are available online, and uh, I, uh, I guess they're playing it every week, I think. I just looked on the website, because I knew it was coming up soon, so you might want to check that out if you haven't. Um, uh you know, I guess uh, I guess the the, the story about uh, about this project, um, as Christopher said, was um, this was originally commissioned uh, by a German television network called Arte. Um, it's actually an arts channel um, that is uh, um, that broadcasts in Germany. They have a French counterpart, so there's a French and German uh, France and German Arte station, uh, and they were really interested in. Um, learning about the north, uh, the north of Canada specifically. Um, they wanted a, uh, at first, kind of an artistic spin on the series, um, which was, I think one of the original ideas was, let's bring Sting to the Arctic. Um, <laughs> and we, 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 and, and we, we, uh, um, uh, we, we, we kind of, uh, we felt a little different about that idea, um, uh, thinking that uh, how wonderful would it be to give um, Arctic artists a voice in all this, since there are so many uh, wonderful ones. Um, but as we started developing it, um, there was a few things that we realized. Um, one, uh, the tremendous scope of the project. This wasn't just about going to one place in the Arctic. This was about essentially... Uh, um, traveling through the Northwest Passage. They wanted the Northwest Passage to kind of be the star. Uh, and we realized that that was kind of going to be a tremendous uh, undertaking um, from, a, from a documentary perspective. So we thought of different ways of sort of developing the story. One of them was to kind of put a bunch of artists onto, a, uh, onto some sort of boat or an icebreaker or one of those big old Russian icebreakers and, uh, and steam through. But uh, uh, but of course, uh, we felt that wouldn't sort of do justice to the journey and, and to the to the land around it. Um, and basically, through some discussions, what it came to the point where we thought, you know, what we want to do is we want to um, tell the story of the Arctic today. And in order to do that, we wanted to um, essentially include as many voices as we could on this journey. We wanted, uh, you know, a scientific voice, a uh, science story, a cultural story, artistic stories, and even uh, an outsider story. We thought it would be good to see some things through an outsider's eyes. So, uh, uh, Christopher, I don't know if you have that slide uh, of the, uh, the sort of ten circles there. Yep, it's up. Okay, great. So that was one of the first things that we plotted as to how would we cover the uh, Northwest Passage from essentially Greenland to Alaska um, within 10 episodes. And that was one of the first things that we kind of looked at. Um, uh, realizing that what we wanted to do is kind of a journey. Um, I guess I'll take a step back. One of the things that we sort of stumbled upon and something we felt that was very telling to sort of the story of the Arctic of today, and especially from a, I believe, a um, uh, kind of a, um, a, a changing climate perspective, is the fact that um, amateur sailors in a small little sailboat are now attempting to go through the Northwest Passage all by themselves. And uh, I'm sure, you know, most of you with your research see this uh, year by year as kind of a growing trend. Uh, and that was something that we felt uh, just on its own was very telling uh, story of of what was what was going on up there. Um, and we started researching and found a number of different uh, vessels that were going to do this uh, or try to attempt to do this trip. And um, we settled upon um, and I don't know if there was any shots of it in the in the teaser that you just saw, but we settled upon a, a Swedish sailing vessel, a small little sailboat, crewed by three people. Um, all amateur sailors that were going to do this tour. 
So the map that you see up there with our little kind of episode circles on there was actually their map based on their stops. And what we determined was that we would try and follow them. And they would be, this is, this is purely from a storytelling device, they would be sort of the through line, um, our arc, so to speak, of how we would get from point A to point B. And as we travel through these areas, um, uh, we would, each circle there would cover kind of a science story, cultural story. We'd have an artist involved um, and we'd see their perspective and sometimes we'd bring all the stories together and sometimes we would sort of, the camera itself would just wander and go off and tell something else. So it really turned into a, a, a very large undertaking uh, for not a lot of money. Um, for those of you that travel up uh, in the north, uh, I'm sure you know sort of the, um, just there's really nothing you can plan <laughs> for. You just have to kind of go with the flow. Um, we had, uh, we ended up having uh, three, uh, I think up to about three crews of four people each um, traveling at any given time to different locations. We had a team of researchers uh, uh, combing through uh, kind of every um, uh, uh, single hamlet uh, um, and, uh, and, and trying to figure out sort of the science that was going on. We got Arctic Net involved, we got the Coast Guard involved. You know, we were pouring over absolutely every single angle to find out um, what different stories that we could, we could tell. And it took months and months of research and about, uh, I think about 60 or so days of shooting um, with many misadventures. Uh, the, the boat that we started following, I don't, I don't want to ruin anything uh, for you if you watch the series, but they had difficulties. Um, but a lot of also wonderful things occurred along the way. And uh, we tried our best to kind of tell a really interesting story and to include uh, uh, the local uh, um, uh, indigenous voices of the Arctic, the scientist voice, you know, the, the, the research that was going up there, the different opinions regarding the changes that are up there, because there are a lot of different opinions. Um, and, uh, you know, from, from a filmmaking point of view and a documentary point, point of view, documentary filmmaker point of view, uh, we wanted it to be in the voice of our subjects and our topic uh, without trying to you know, interfere too much. Um, uh, and, and, and because of that, people can agree, disagree, you know, comment, debate, uh, some of the stuff that, that we sort of portrayed. Um, but what we feel we, we accomplished was really kind of uh, um, sort of trying to portray the Arctic in a way that it hasn't been done before. And uh, I'm not sure, I can go on about other stuff, but Christopher, if you want to direct me in any way or... You have yeah, any questions? And, I, and I, th I think from a from a storytelling perspective, what what do you hope to deliver to now a global audience about about the Arctic? Well, you know, I I think really the the Arctic is a um, is is a. It's a very complicated, unique place. There, there, there's nowhere else that like it in the world. Um, it's about to go through some uh, some major changes. The development that is going on up there, the exploration that's going on up there, um, the uh, you know the 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 um, voice of the of the uh, cultures that are that are being starting to be heard. You know, there's a lot of changes uh, that, that are taking place. So I think it's really maybe to sort of uh, give a glimpse and uh, as to as to what it means, you know, all the things that we have to be careful that we have to be aware of. Um, you know, one of my favorite stories that we covered up there, and and again, this is it's sort of like a, 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 a kind of a two uh, it, it's like a, it's like a two-headed issue here. It's it's hard to know, you know, which which side to follow. You just need to hear all voices. Um, uh, it's it's. It's fascinating and worrisome to to get a sense of all the uh, um, big cruise ships that are now starting to go through the Northwest Passage, um, and uh, a lot of them are coming from Europe. But there's some some uh, some that are, uh, I, as far as I know, based uh, in in North America as well that are doing tours uh, in these big Russian icebreakers or whatever kind of ships that they get. Uh, and are stopping in the different uh, uh, communities 
uh, which on one hand you can be seen as uh, you know kind of an interesting um, uh, development for the communities uh, to be able to uh, create some income, have a bit of uh, um, uh, 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 selling um, arts and crafts and, and different sort of things and, and having tour guides and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but also there's a big pull on the resources of these little communities that don't really, you know, that only get supplies come in every few months and, you know, have to truck their waste around and stuff like that. So it puts a big strain on them as well. Not to mention a safety issue. Uh, these boats are going through and as far as I can recall, you know, we have uh, we have the two icebreakers. Uh, there's not really much uh, up there in a way of a rescue plan if anything were to happen with any of these ships, not to mention the oil tankers that might be, you know, going through there at a more common rate. So, uh, you know, these are things that we wanted to bring awareness to and have people kind of understand what was sort of happening in there. And, and it's true, you know, between... Um, uh, the Canadian broadcast, uh, at some point, this will be uh, seen in, in the States, no doubt, or at least available, you know, through through digital uh, distribution, uh, but also, you know, seen through Europe and playing through festivals, you know, I, I, think, a, I think a voice of the Arctic will, will, will start to be heard. Thank you. Well, I'd like to open it up to...